Right. Let's give them another round of applause, folks, for that. Thank you very much. What a blessing. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10 is where we're going to be, or your iPad, or your iPhone, or whatever you have. Let's just get into the Word of God this morning. We're going to take just a few moments and unpack. I know it usually scares people when there's been a 35-minute Easter cantata, and then a Baptist preacher stands up and says, turn to your Bibles. Well, we're going to have some fun. I've already talked to my PowerPoint gal back there, my adopted daughter, and she's going to work with me, but we're going to go to town. I just want to unpack some truth for you this morning. I think it'd be an injustice, Bobby, if we didn't get into the Word of God just a little bit here and look about what they just sang about. This is the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And have you noticed that words are powerful, are they not? Words are powerful. Words can hurt. And I had that speech impediment when I was a child, and I remember words that kids would say to me, and they were hurtful. Words can hurt when a doctor walks in and says, He's gone. They can hurt. Or she's gone. Or they can be joyous words when the love of your life says to you, I love you. And it's that love that you've never experienced before. I want to talk to you today, and as you look at the screen, the title will be Five Words from the Tomb. And I want to take this text, and I want to unpack it just a little bit, and I just want to talk about some words that were very powerful from the tomb and why they were so powerful. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the tomb is empty. And I always have these people come up to me and say, aren't you fearful that one day they will find the, the, the remains of Jesus Christ and that will destroy all your faith? No, I'm not afraid of that at all. Because, number one, I don't believe it's ever going to happen because my Lord and Savior is alive and well. All truth is His truth. Folks, all, they say, well, don't you wish that they wouldn't look around so hard? No, I think it's awesome. Go looking, folks, because it's going to prove to you that Jesus Christ is alive. But there were some words spoken at this tomb that I want us to talk about. So let's read verses 1 through 10 of chapter 28, and then I want to just unpack a little bit for you uh, on this Easter morning. It says, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake because the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. Folks, don't ask me why he was sitting on it, but I just think that's just a real awesome view okay some of you i've been here since september you know my warped sense of humor but to me it was kind of like he just hopped up there and went ladies you know what i mean i mean he was just up there like uh-huh this i mean it was just a beautiful image of the power of the lord at this point then to continue on his appearance was a, was like lightning and his robe was white as snow the guards were so shaken with fear of him that they became like dead men. Let me unpack that just a moment before we go any further. Do you understand what the writer here is describing to you? In a very depictive way, in a very picturesque way, he's telling us how bright the light was. And if you've ever been out in the deserts of Nevada and it's been a pitch dark night and there's been a lightning storm, have you ever had one of those flashes of lightnings that flashed so brightly it blinded you and you couldn't look? And for a while you had the blue spots in front of your eyes and you're just like, wow! That was amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the radiant of the, of the image that we have here. It was so bright and so powerful that these men were fearful. Even the women had seen the brightness of the Lord. And it wasn't what, like one strike. It was like a continuous strike of lightning that was blinding them. You put that with a mighty earthquake... No wonder they were like dead men. What does that mean? Did they pass out? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us that. Remember, the Bible doesn't tell us everything we want to know. It just tells us everything we need to know. The point was, it's not about what the soldiers did. It was about the power and the glory of the Lord at that day. 
Well, let's go on. But the angel told the women. Now, I find this very interesting that he wasn't telling the whole crowd. We're going to unpack that in just a little bit. Don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has been resurrected just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead. In fact, he is going ahead of you to Galilee and you will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So departing quickly from the tomb with fear, now remember that as well, and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then Jesus met them and said, good morning. Now come on. Do you think that didn't just send a leap in their heart right at that moment? And that's the best phrase, good morning. I mean, I just love that, that Jesus is not, well, we'll get to that in just a moment. I just love the Lord. And they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. And Jesus told them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. Let's pray. Father, wow, what a powerful text. What a glorious morning. Lord, there would be no Easter without the resurrection. There would be no salvation in those songs, those beautiful songs of grace. Lord, there would be no grace without your life. And so, Lord, as I unpack this, as Lord, as what you've laid on my heart, I pray that I will not fail you. But, Lord, I pray that I will be able to proclaim your truth in a clear and simple way so that if there's anyone here that is yet to believe, Lord, that this morning they would not leave this place without believing and receiving that grace that you offer to all of us. And, Lord, second of all, that all of us may stop for a moment and just come and worship you and forget about the busyness of this day. Lord, don't, don't let the busyness of this day distract what the most important thing is to do, and that is for us to fall at your feet and cry out your name and worship you, Father, for you are alive. I ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. The first words of the tomb that I want to point out to you is, don't be afraid. Notice that in, in verse 5. And he said, the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. Now, really, the soldiers didn't need to be afraid. Which, by the way, can I just prove to you the character? These words prove to you the character of who this Lord is. Because if you remember, as we heard in the cantata, there was a place there when after they had beaten him and they'd crucified him and placed him on that tree, that he said what? He said these famous words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, this is proof. This story is proof is that Jesus is not coming into the world to condemn the world because the world's already condemned. He's coming into the world to save us. So if you're sitting there today feeling condemned and feeling like, wow, I have sins in my life that cannot be forgiven, here's proof to you. He came back on this morning. He came back and said, don't be afraid to these women. But notice he did nothing to the guards. Now, if he was a vengeful God and an angry God, what would he have done? The first thing he would have done, I mean, more than likely these guards were at least present. There's a very good chance that these guards were part of the crucifixion, that they beat him. If he was a vengeful God, he would have came back and did what? Struck them dead and gave them what they deserved. But the glorious thing, listen to me, the glorious thing is none of us get what we deserve with Jesus Christ. We all deserve death and we all deserve hell. We're all wicked sinners, but by amazing grace, I'm saved. My chains are gone. I've been set free. And so then he says to these women, do not be afraid. But the very next phrase is what gives us the key. What brings the lack of fear into our lives? He says, because I know that you are seeking Jesus. You want fear to leave your life? Seek Jesus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What are you seeking today? This is a glorious moment where all of a sudden they realize, I don't have to fear. Wait a minute. If the Lord can conquer death, then I don't need to fear death. I don't need to fear sickness. I don't need to fear sin. I don't need to fear that, oh, I, I would give my... You know what? I've had so many people say this to me before. I would give my life to Jesus Christ, but I know that I'll just go out and sin again. Wait a minute. You're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And listen, you're loved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that we go out and sin so that grace may abound. God forbid, Paul says. But it does say that when we do sin, guess what? He still has enough to forgive us. I am redeemed. So here's these women. 
they were scared as well. They'd seen this brightness, this light. They'd felt the earthquake. They were trembling. Oh, no, what are we going to do? Are we going to die because of this? Are we in harm's way? And the Lord's angel says, don't be afraid. I know that you're seeking Jesus. Now, what's confusing to this text is he had just told them, don't be afraid. But if you go on down to verse 8, it says, so departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. It's a different word. It's a different fear. See, before they had the fear of death. Now it's more the fear of the unknown. Have you ever been there? The Lord had just sent them out. Go tell the disciples. Man, they're probably just running. They're probably giggling a little bit. And all of a sudden it's sinking in on them. Okay, we're going to tell them, but nobody's going to believe me. Nobody's going to believe this story. A little bit of fear and anxiety is what it was. But listen, I want to tell you, even with the Lord, the Bible says, worry for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. So what a powerful word from the tomb. Let me just tell you this Easter morning, whatever your fear is out there, you can lose that fear in Jesus Christ. You can have a boldness that I cannot understand, that that the only thing I can make sense of it is I know who I believe in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed. I know who he is, and I'm standing upon those promises this morning. Let's look at the second words that come from the tomb this morning. Not only did he say, do not be afraid, but he said, come and see. Come and see. Notice here. He says, listen, do not be afraid. I know that you're seeking Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has been resurrected just as he said, come and see. Do you know what this morning's all about? We want you, if you've never really seen Jesus Christ for who he is, we want you to come and see that, guess what? The tomb is empty. The stone has been rolled away. And by the way, can I just point out to you, Jesus wants you to see that this morning. He's not some mystical creature out there going, wait a minute, I don't want anybody to see. That's a rabbit that leaves eggs, okay? Nobody ever sees him. He just comes by. Come on, guys, that should have got more of a laugh than that. (laughs) Do I need to remind you of the Jimmy Stewart movie, Harvey? Do I need to go that far? No, Jesus is not some mystical creature out there. He says, I want you to see that I'm not in the tomb. I noticed the angel didn't say, hey, listen, he's not here. Take my word for it and go tell. No, he wants you to see. Why? I wrote this down. This thought kept coming to my head. If it doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. It makes sense to me, and I love it, okay? So act like you do. It'll make me feel better, okay? But listen to this. I wrote this down when I was reading this this week. It says, the revelation of truth brings clear vision to the eyes of faith. Now, let me say that again. The revelation of truth brings clear vision to the eyes of faith. Because I kept thinking about the more that God reveals himself, the more that my eyes of faith see Jesus for who he is, the more that I realize what he is. And he says to these women, come in here. The Lord's angel says, come in here and see he's not here. Nobody stole him. He hasn't just vanished. He's not here. He was raised from the dead. Wow. He wants to be seen. Can can I just throw another one at you? Why was the stone rolled away? Okay, 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 follow this. I really love this part. This is awesome. No, it really is. I know he's in there going, no, it's not. It is. It really is. Did Jesus need the stone rolled away to get out of there? No. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, the stone was not rolled away for him. It was rolled away for us so that those women could see. Folks, it was rolled away by the hand of God. No man could have done that. We know the soldiers didn't do it. We know these two ladies certainly couldn't have, uh, have rolled the stone away. But he says, come and see, the stone is rolled away. And that, my friend, is why I think the angel was on top of the stone. Because have you ever been in front of something and it's been obvious, but you didn't see it? I think the angel wanted to make sure. Do you see where the stone's at? Now, that's my theology. You don't have to go down that path if you don't want to. But I, I, I think the Lord was thinking of remedial people like me that need that little extra visual guide. 
come and see. My cry to you this morning is, will you come and see that the tomb is empty? It is real. You can put your faith in it. You can believe in him. It is true. Jesus did not lie. He told them he was going to raise from the dead. He told them he was going to come back. Nothing he said was a lie. In Old Testament prophecy, it said he would come back. And this is the revelation of it all. This is Easter, ladies and gentlemen, to come and see that the tomb is empty. He says, I want you to see it. And my greatest hope for you this morning is that you will see it. And did you know the first century, not just Christians, but non-Christians, also held to the faith or the belief or the truth that Jesus rose? Did you know even Julius Caesar believed that the Lord rose again? Even though he wasn't a follower, he had heard the stories, he'd heard the eyewitness accounts, and therefore he believed it. Ancient writers, even before, it wasn't until the second and third century that Gnostics and others came and said, well, it wasn't really a bodily resurrection. And then they started down. Have you ever noticed how people rewrite history? I mean, even with our own nation, it's amazing how some of our own history is rewritten. And that's what they've done with the story of Jesus Christ. That's why we have this truth and these powerful words that say, listen, don't be afraid. Come and see. The tomb was empty. As if it had never, as one other gospel writer writes, been disturbed. Well... Just understand that Christianity begins where religions religions end, and they end at the empty tomb because it's not about a religion. It drives me crazy. Can I tell you that? That's my last Sunday here. I guess I can. What are you going to do? Fire me? <laughs> Sorry, just a little preacher humor. <laughs> drives me crazy when they go, oh, you belong to that religion, Christianity. No, I belong to the Savior, Jesus Christ. This is not. This is about a relationship for me. I don't want a phony, fake religion. Do you? Religion says, come to this place and worship. Jesus says, come to me and worship. And it's not about a place, it's not about a sepulcher, it's not about a tomb, it's not about a structure or a grave. It is Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He who has come to take away the sins of the world. Well, what's the next words? He's not here, he's risen. I kind of took two phrases there and put them together, but that's what the angel said, isn't that what he said? Wait a minute, you come to see Jesus, but he's not here. In fact, he even told them, he's been resurrected. Very powerful words. Because he knew their first thought would be they stole him or something happened or, or he just went on to heaven and he's left us here alone. But no, the truth was he's been resurrected. What a powerful story. If he can beat death, there's nothing he can't do. Do you understand that? That's why these words were so powerful. What, was, what scares us the most? Death. And here in one moment, Jesus destroyed and conquered death. Man, these are powerful words. He's not here. He's risen, just like he said he would. And then he's offered us. What did he say? If you will believe on him, you shall not, what? Perish, but have everlasting life. Wait a minute. You mean he didn't lie, that he said he would come back, he would resurrect, and now I remember those words that if I would believe in him, that I would not perish, I'd have everlasting life. Do you see why it's so easy to believe in him? It's because he's never told us a lie. Everything was true. He's been resurrected. He even told him, and on the third day, I will resurrect. I will come again. It's not here. I love what the writer of, Homo, writer of Romans writes. This is the only verse other than this that I have today for you. I just want you to look at the screen in Romans chapter 8. Look what he says. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will have the power to separate us. Listen to that. Not just me. Separate who? Come on. Separate who? That's us, folks. That's you and me, seekers of Jesus Christ. Come on. Now, listen, that's got to be more fun than find a five-pound chocolate bunny in your basket this morning. You know what I mean? Come on. That's got to be pretty exciting that 
us, that nothing will separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are those great words? That's who I want to be this morning. I want to be like that man. I want to be like that author. I want to be like Paul who says, I am persuaded. I am, that means I am convinced. I am certain. I know it to be a fact. Why? Because of the power of the tomb, do you guys understand that Paul could not have that belief if Jesus himself had not said, or the angel had not said to them, he's not here, he's resurrected. If he can do that, listen, is there really any power that we need to fear? Is there anything out there that we ought to fear? If he can conquer death like that, and if a stone like that can be rolled away. Now, it's not just a death. If you go on into the New Testament and begin to read in Philippians, it says that he was crucified, even suffering the humility of crucifixion. You've seen the movie, The Passion of Christ, I hope. And if you've seen that, then you've seen a glimpse, as much as they could possibly show you. But they said that Jesus was beaten, unrecognizable, that people did not even recognize who he was. Now, listen, it's not just that he rose from the dead, ladies and gentlemen. It's that he rose from the dead after that horrendous, awful, terrible beating that he took on the cross. That's impressive. That's what today's all about. That's what those songs were all about. That's why Paul was able to say, I am persuaded that if he can go through that, there's nothing. So whatever you're facing in life today, do you understand? Man, if you're going through a divorce, that will not separate you from the love of God. As painful and as hard as that is, if you've just lost a loved one, that will not separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. If you're dealing with an addiction, that will not suffer, uh, separate you from the love of Jesus. Isn't that glorious? That, listen, even though sometimes your families give up on us, they get frustrated with us. But when it comes to Jesus, nothing will separate me from the love of Jesus Christ. That's Easter. Folks, I don't know any better way to put it to you than he's not here, he's resurrected, and because of that, I can face all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. Well, let's go to the next words. All the way to the very end, they told him, go tell the disciples. You'll see him there. But it's the words at the very end that he says, they will see me there. Why did I grab these? I find that very powerful. Because it wasn't about Mary and the other Mary. It was about the whole world. Christians, listen to me now. Yes, Jesus died for us, but not just us. And I find that very powerful where he said, go and tell the other disciples. He wanted them to see. We know that eventually over 500 saw Jesus alive. He wants the world to see. And the greatest way to show the world Christians is for us to go out there and be the image of Christ, the love of Christ. I know we get our anger, we get our upset, and I have people come, don't I deserve a right to be mad? Folks, Jesus had a right to be mad, but he didn't kill even the guards that helped crucify him. That day, he showed grace and mercy and love. Even when he came back, he didn't seek to destroy. We know that he could have called 10,000 angels and destroyed everyone in anger and wrath and had every right to do that. But he gave that up so that they might see See, I worry about these preachers that all they preach is just damnation and hellfire. Not, listen, I don't say there's not a place for that. But ladies and gentlemen, we really need to preach the grace of Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, grace is the major theme of the Word of God. Grace. And they will see them. Even Peter, who denied him three times, he's going to see me. Isn't that amazing? Which brings us to the last words, and we're going to close. I told you not to worry. That's not... I 
want to just make this very simple and plain. But I want you to go back to verse 9 if you still have your Bibles open. And then Jesus met them and said, good morning. Now listen to the next phrase. And they came and they took hold of his feet and worshipped him. I'm going to take some words that aren't even in this context. Because, see, I think the whole story is come to me. I, I think it just screams, come to me. He wasn't trying to avoid these ladies. He said, good morning, ladies. But what they do, they, they fell on their face. They kissed his feet. And what? They worshiped him. Here's my conviction. So many times on Easter we get so busy to run here and run there. and Boy, we've got this activity and we've got this act. Boy, we better put the ham in by a certain time. Or that preacher better not go over too long. Or little pineapples are going to swivel up to nothing and on top of that ham. <laughs> Lord knows I love ham, so I don't want any of that to happen to any of you. But that's not what this day's about. I, I love being with family. That's why my wife is here with me. I, I told her, I said, look, for several weekends, I, I'm, a, I'm without you, but it's Easter, and so you're going to Vegas with me, and I don't want to be alone. Sitting in the airport today, because I guess we're going to figure out somewhere for Easter lunch. We've got to fly home. I want to go get a Philly cheesesteak. She says, that isn't good for me. Let's eat something healthy. So I'm kind of dreading bringing her now, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's, not, it's not about that. Family's great. I want you to spend time with your family. Family is wonderful. But it is about come to him. You, you can trust him. Come to him. He is the Savior. Come to him. He is the Lord. Come to him. He's not there in the tomb. Come to him. So we're going to take just a few moments this morning and we're going to give you an opportunity to come to him. Christian, it may just mean that this Easter morning you want to come and just kneel before this altar and say, Lord, I, I want to be like Mary's that came before you and they fell on their face and they worshipped you. It may be that you just want to stay seated right where you're at and just cry out to him. Maybe just raise your hands before him and say, Lord, it's all about you and I'm so grateful the tomb is empty. You're not there. And Lord, on this glorious morning, this Easter morning, and by the way, Christian, every morning should be Easter morning for us because the tomb is always empty and the stone is always rolled away. Maybe there's someone else here this morning that you've never, you've never seen Jesus like you have this morning. Maybe some of the words of the songs that we heard this morning spoke to you. And you said, I want that freedom. Listen, it's not anything that I can do for you. It's not that baptismal waters. But we do say, come and trust Jesus Christ. I I'll pray with you. Man, I, I love to listen to people's prayers as you cry out and say, wait a minute. I want God in my life. And I, I want to see the tomb is empty. But now is the time. Now is the time. Don't wait. You can have Jesus. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. It's hope. It's, we don't have to fear. I don't have to fear sin. I don't have to fear death. I don't have to fear hell. I don't have to fear messing up because I am a mess up, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I have failed him so much, but I can still run to him and say, Oh, Abba, Father. Oh, Daddy, I love you, and I'm so sorry. And he'll wrap his arms around me, and he'll say, Kevin, I love you. Listen, he knows we're a mess up. You're not surprising him with anything that you do. He's not up there going, wow, I didn't expect that out of you. He expects it out of us. He knows what we are as sinful people. And that's why he died on the cross so that we don't have to die in that anymore. That I can be free. I can have the chains broken off of me. And I can be set free. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, you can go to my grave after I die. And you may see a head marker. And you may even see some earthly remains. But I'm not going to be there. For those who are dead in Christ are with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be in a place called heaven. And it's going to be glorious. Because the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. 
Let me pray for you. Father, we're going to take just a few moments and we're going to worship you and sing in this song. Lord, now is the time to come. Now is the time to come and to worship you and to bow before you. And Lord, to lift our voices. Lord, maybe just cry out to you. Lord, thank you. Thank you that the tomb is empty. Lord, maybe today is the day of salvation for someone. And as that young little girl did not long ago, they would have the courage to step out and say, I need Jesus in my life. And I don't want to leave this place until I, I've asked him to come in. I need someone to tell me how. And Lord, I want to be that someone for them. Oh, Father, let us come and worship you. In your name I pray. Amen. Stand with me as we sing. You come. You come right now. Thank you. 